Hello, gang. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Calvary Chapel. And I'm so glad you're able to be with us here. Uh, we're going to be picking up where we left off last week, and that's in the epistle of uh, 1 John. Uh, we covered chapter 1 last week. Let's go to uh, chapter 2. So the epistle of 1 John, chapter 2. Before we do that, I'd love to pray with you if we could do that right now. Again, Father, we thank you for your word. We know it's your word that basically tells us exactly where we're at in our walk with you. And we know that sometimes your word corrects us, it chastens us, it comforts us. But Lord, it sharpens us, and we need to be sharp. And so, Father, in these days that we live in, we're asking that today, right now, as we go through your word, you would fine-tune our thoughts and our minds and our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a little bit of background as we talked about this uh, fellow, John, before, the apostle. Again, he was uh, basically at times he could have been a hothead. We talked about that a little bit. But after Pentecost, after the cross of Christ, and then, and then Pentecost, and he was filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit, John was a different man, completely different. And now he writes this epistle, and it's, it talks a lot about love. And in chapter 1, we talked about forgiveness and basically our forgiveness, being forgiven by God. But we get to chapter 2 today now. We're going to find our responsibility on forgiveness here. So I'm just going to jump in on chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And so John's making it clear that as Christians, we sin. We know that. But we got to be careful because many times we use the argument, well, hey, I'm human, so I sin, as if that's an excuse to sin. we got to watch that language. But John's making it clear that we do sin. But he's also making it clear that we don't have to sin. When I look at this word propitiation, where it says, and he, or Jesus himself, is the propitiation for our sins, basically that means he made atonement for our sins. But I like this description a little bit better, especially when we talked about being a victim. Many times people say, I was a victim of that person, or I was a victim of those circumstances, or I was a victim, and because I, I am the way I am, because of so, the way somebody acted in my past, or things like that. And that may very well be. But when I look at the word propitiation, look at it this way. Jesus became the victim of your sin. He became the victim of my sin. In other words, I got to watch when I, I start uh, playing the victim card. There was one true victim in my life, and that was Jesus Christ. He became the victim. He's the one that took my penalty and your penalty for my sin. And so John's making this very clear that yes, we sin, we do sin, but we don't have to sin. And in case we miss the point, because I sin, Jesus became that victim for the repercussions of my sin. And now he's going to go a little deeper in chapter, verse 3 rather. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. So I can say I love God and, and I'm following God and things like this. And the Lord says, okay, fine, but this is how you know that you know me. You're going to follow me. You're not just going to take the forgiveness or talk about grace. We're going to talk about this. You, if you say that you know me, you're going to keep my commandments. It continues in verse 4. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected or is made complete in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also walk just as he walked. So again, we sin. We know we sin, but we don't have to sin. And so the difference now before Christ comes into our life and after Christ, I'm sorry, before Christ was in our life and after Christ comes into our life, there's a difference. There's a marked difference in our life. It says that as we look at, at this here, he who says he abides or I live in Christ ought himself also to walk in Christ. So where sin may have been a habit of my life, a natural occurrence, now because of Christ, it is now not a natural occurrence. And when I do sin, it just drives us crazy that we sin against our Lord. 
Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So the new commandment, the old commandment, you could go back and forth, and it really is about loving God, but this loving God is an action. If I'm going to say I love God, then I'm going to follow him. And then when it says, because the darkness is passing away, I love that. The more of Jesus Christ that comes into our life, the more his light shines to us like never before. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother, now watch this. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. And we could go, let's dig a little bit on that. He who says he is in the light or that I follow God, but I'm purposely holding a grudge against somebody. In fact, I really like holding this grudge. It makes me feel good that, that I'm holding this over a brother or a sister in Christ of mine. Basically, he says, I'm walking in darkness. I'm not allowing the fullness of God's light come into my life. He who loves his brother abides in the light. In other words, we forgave them. We love our brother now. And there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because darkness, the darkness has blinded his eyes. So that's what holding a grudge does. That's what walking, walking in an, an attitude of, of hate and unforgiving a brother. So again, yes, we were forgiven. The first chapter of First John told us that, you know, if we sin, we have an advocate. He'll forgive us our sins. But now in chapter 2, John, the apostle, is getting down to business with us that he's the victim for my sin. So if he was the victim for my sin, watch this. I got to be very careful on what kind of grudge. I better not hold any grudge upon anybody because I can't hold them under the thumb, especially when Jesus Christ has set me free. And these next few verses begin to talk about spiritual maturity. He says, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. So he talks about babes in Christ, newcomers to Christ Jesus. So if you're new in Christ, one of the greatest things about walking in the Lord right off the bat is realizing we're forgiven. The greatest thing I can remember is that when I came to Christ, I realized that I was forgiven. I, I couldn't get over that he forgave me. He forgave me of all my wretched past, all my present and all my future sins. He forgave me. But I wasn't to, just to stay there because look at the next one. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. And then he talks about another age of maturity in our walk. He calls them fathers. Now, this isn't just, it, it could be generic for men and women. But he's talking about fathers here, basically saying these are people that have been walking with the Lord quite some time. In other words, these people got battle scars. In other words, they, they've been through the areas to where they, they met well and, and they were misunderstood and they had to forgive people and people uh, said bad things about them and maybe spread some gossip. Well, they've been through the ringer. They got battle scars. Basically said you've known him who's from the beginning. One of the greatest ways to know Jesus Christ is to go through what he went through. I remember some years ago, I asked the Lord, you know, Lord, I want to know how you feel. I want to know what goes on in your mind. Well, then the Lord started allowing me to go through some tough times to where I began to experience some things that really began to get under my craw. And the Lord spoke to my heart. He says, well, you wanted to know how I felt about things. This is it. This is how I feel about them. So these are the ones with battle scars. He goes back here to the next one. I write to you little, oh, I'm sorry, I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. Now he's talking about people have, they've came to the Lord. Now they're beginning to really grow in Christ. They're, they're strong. You've overcome the wicked one. You're learning how to pray. You're learning how to do battle. And you're overcoming. You're seeing victories in your life. It says, I write to you little children because you have known the Father. And that's a beautiful thing when a person comes to know Christ. Again, they've understood forgiveness. And then it says, I've written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. In other words, these are the oak trees of, 
of, of, of the faith. They've been around. I, I got certain people in my life. They got a lot of years under their belt. And I watch them how they react to crisis. I watch them in my walk with Christ. And I looked at them and I began to realize there wasn't a whole lot of stuff that shook them. The, the bad news came their way and yes, they grieved and, and they cried. But yet they realized there was more to this life. And these were the ones that, that basically were not shaken. They were the, these guys were the oak trees of faith in my life. And some of them have passed on. Some of them are still alive at this point. And then it says, I've written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So again, he moves back to the young people who are in Christ and you're strong. You're strong. You're the ones that are in the battle. You're in the heat of the battle. And that battle isn't just to stand for righteousness. God brings his people into battles. He allows them to go into battles so that we get strong in Jesus Christ. So if you're in the midst of a battle right now, you know, there could be various reasons, but one of those reasons is that God wants to strengthen you. He wants to toughen you up. And it doesn't mean that we have to be a teenager or in our 20s and our 30s. You could be in your 50s or 60s and still going through battles and God is still strengthening our faith with you. So John speaks in verses 12, 13, and 14 of different areas of maturity in our walk with Christ. And so where are you at this point? And you see, I or you cannot answer that. Only the Holy Spirit can answer it. And maybe we've got some areas in our life that we need to mature in, in Jesus Christ. In verse 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, we've talked about the lust of the flesh, and you know, we talk about the lust of the eyes. Some of that's pretty evident. You know, we're lusting after the things in the world. It doesn't have to be sexual lust. And the lust of the eyes, we see things that we think we got to have. You know, I make my life complete. But there's one thing that's highly overlooked here, and that's the pride of life. Pride. The pride of life. Even the Apostle Paul said, if I'm going to glory in anything, I'm going to glory in the cross of Christ. Now watch this. The pride of life. Now I'm, this, is, this might pick a scab here. And if it does, that's good. This is where you might do something good. In other words, your intentions are good. You're doing it for the Lord. You felt the Lord called you to do something really good. And you did. And, and you see it and it worked out. But somebody else gets the glory for that. In other words, maybe you involved them in this and, and somebody saw that they were involved in it. Maybe they were just part of the thing. But then all of a sudden, somebody comes along while you're there and they come and pat them on the back and says, Hey, I see what you did, man. That was awesome. And they got all the glory for it. And, and, and it's like you're thinking, well, wait a minute here. This, I'm the one that started this. I'm the one that did that. You see, the pride of life many times is when you came up, God gave you that idea, you started it, you initiated it, you didn't carry through it. But all of a sudden, somebody comes along and they were part of it, and somebody comes and pats them on the back. How did that make you feel? Because they didn't even acknowledge that you were part of it. And the other person didn't even say, well, hey, I was just here for a couple of minutes. It was really them. They take all the glory. That could be the pride of life. And, and that really begins to show what goes on in our life. And then it says, little children, it is the last hour. Now remember, 2,000 years ago, John the Apostle said that. We've been in the last days for almost 2,000 years. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. We're in the last hour. We've been in the last days since Christ left this earth 2,000 years ago, but we are now in the last hour of the last days. And, and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. And John the Apostle, who, who the Lord used to, to write and pen down the book of Revelation, he knew about this Antichrist, this person that was going to come. Gang, listen to this. Please hear this. This is the last hour. And I could go off on a Bible study 
Listen, there's so much stuff going on behind the scenes. You know, we're talking about the COVID-19 and everything that's going on right now. And it is a real, it is a real virus. People are dying from it. Please do not mistake that. I, I am not one of those that are going to say that it's all fake. It is not fake. I mean, the evidence is proving very, very different right there. But the things that are going on to propagate, to bring this world in line for the last days to get ready for the tribulation period, it is the last hour. And I believe how fitting that John is saying, let's get our garments teamed up here, tuned up in white. It is the last hour. He said the Antichrist is coming, but many Antichrists have already come. In other words, a type and figure of the, of the Antichrist has been here. It's been here for over 2,000 years. Remember, Antichrist is just against Christ, is what this is. John goes on in verse 19, they, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. In other words, they started out good, but then all of a sudden they came up with some whacked out doctrine, something that came against Christ and came against the Bible, and it was a it could have been a feel-good message, you know, something that rebuked everything that the Bible said, or maybe even part of it. It says, but you, believer, he's you. Now, now make this personal, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. I want to read this here from uh, the book of Psalms here. How do, I, how do I understand these things? In Psalm 119, verse 9, it says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Now, before I finish this, with my whole heart. And this is where John is saying, you know better. You know this thing. Why? Because with our whole heart, are you seeking God with your whole, whole, whole heart? It's been said, I, I had a brother in Christ tell me this a long time ago. Five minutes after the rapture or five minutes after being in heaven, we're going to wish we had five more minutes on earth to give our all for five more minutes. And then it says, Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Why did John say that you know better? Because he assumed that the reader of the Bible had God's word hidden in his heart so that when we do things that are out of character of God, then it's going to prick a heart. Remember, we're going to sin, but we don't have to sin anymore, especially if we have the Spirit of God living within us. And it talks about the lies and things like this. You know, one of the things that I'm concerned about here, you know, the narrative of the Bible, the narrative of truth, and the narrative of everything is being changed right now. And I remember the Lord speaking to my heart one time, a long time ago, and I know this is biblical. It says, just because somebody believes a lie, it doesn't make that lie a truth. So remember, just because somebody believes a lie, it doesn't make that lie a truth. All that does was make the believer of that lie deceived. And that's a sad place to be in. It says, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Now this is where John is. We Remember we started in chapter 1 last week. It says, Look, I have touched him, I have felt him, I have walked with him. In fact, you know, I'm taking a little conjecture here. I even smelled his breath. I was that close to the Lord. So he's saying, anybody who has the audacity to say that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, or Jesus Christ is not God, is a liar. Right? That's pretty strong wording, isn't it? Well, that's a very strong truth. So we have to believe that Jesus Christ is part of the triunity of God. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct separate persons, but yet one in the Godhead. So whoever denies that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is in fact God, it says, is Antichrist. That's the spirit of Antichrist. Verse 24 Therefore, let that abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. 
If that what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. What's your goal in life, gang? Think about, think about this. Right now, it could be, well, I'm just wishing things would hurry up and get back to normal. Maybe that's your goal. <laughs> I don't know if things are ever going to get back to normal the way things are right now. And you might say, well, we've been through things before. Not as, not as the whole world, not, not like it is now. It, it, it's never been like this before. What is your goal? And, and John the Apostle said, this is the prize. This is the goal for the believer. Eternal life. Being in Christ, with, being with Christ in heaven for all eternity. So if our goal is to hurry up, get to that retirement age, or get that boat, or get that house, or get that first grandchild, you're going to be let down. Those are great things, but you will be let down. Our goal is to be eternal life, to have eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And, that, and you do not need that anyone teach you. Now watch, you don't need that. In other words, we need teachers. I need teachers. You need teachers. That's not what he's saying. But you have the wisdom of God of saying, look, Jesus Christ is Lord. And I have that in me because I know the Bible. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it is taught you, you will abide in him. Now I'm going to come back. We're going to one more little bit here, and then we're going to come back to that word abide. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have the confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. In other words, when Jesus Christ appears, whether it be by rapture, which I believe is very soon, or by death, that when we see him or we're approached by him or involved, we won't be ashamed. In other words, if we die, we're going to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come in, enter into the joy of your Lord. Or if we're raptured, or if the rapture happens, we're with him. We won't be left behind. We won't be ashamed. It says, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices, there's the key, practices righteousness is born of him so now we've got the gift of forgiveness in chapter one now we got the responsibilities of one who is being who has been forgiven now we talked about the 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 wrath and the antichrist and things like that coming up but listen let's talk about that word abide what does the word abide mean the apple trees are not on the trees right now, but this fall, I, I hope you don't have to wait that long to see this, but in the fall, you'll begin to see apple, you'll see apples on the trees. And what holds that apple to a tree is a little stem. That little stem is attached to a smaller branch, which is attached to a bigger branch, which is attached to the main trunk of that. That apple that is, is abiding, that's the best picture of, I know of abiding that I've ever seen. All that apple is doing is staying attached to the tree, staying attached. You don't find that apple squirming and twisting and trying to swing and say, oh, I wish I was like that other apple, or I wish I was closer to that apple, or I wish I was closer to this. All that apple do, all that apple is doing is just hanging there, just hanging on that limb right there. And when it's time to be picked, the person that owns that apple tree will come and just pluck that apple at the right time and say, this is exactly the way I wanted it to be. Here's the problem with squirming and trying and striving in life. If that apple could, it can't, but if it could twist and turn and do everything on its own, if it twisted itself long enough and hard enough, it would twist itself loose and it would fall down to the ground. Maybe that's what that app, maybe, maybe you're that apple. You don't like the position you're in. So you're twisting and turning and striving. Well, that apple fell to the ground. And guess what awaits them on that ground? First of all, it's going to get bruised. The part of the apple that hit the ground is going to get soft and it's not going to be good for anything. But then the worms and the bugs and everything are right down there. All the Lord is telling us to do is to abide. Abide in Him. Be attached to Him. Do what he says to do. Just love him. Forgive people. Don't hold grudges. Just hang on 
and just be attached to the vine and all the fruit of the Holy Spirit that was in Jesus Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, you got to check that out. Love, peace, long-suffering is going to flow into you. And the next thing you know, you're going to start looking like Christ. And this is exactly what John is trying to get us to see in these chapters as he writes this epistle. So gang, that's enough for today. I hope you take God's word and whatever he's telling you to do, just do it and do it in his strength. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray that your word now would begin to bear fruit in our hearts and in our lives and that we would be that fruit, that apple that's just attached to the vine, allowing the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ come flowing through us. In your name we pray. Amen. See you next week, gang. Love you.